If you want one of those frameable memories of Kenya's astounding natural beauty, visit the Abadea Ranges. They'll knock you out. But like many other things in Kenya, its beauty and the usefulness of the rivers that spring from here shouldn't be taken at face value. The Abadeas have quenched our thirst as a country for millennia. It's what ties all Kenyans together, if you think about it. This water pillar feeds the cities. It feeds our countryside and it feeds our pastoral communities downstream from here. But this wonderful looking waterfall and the many that surround it here in the Abadea Ranges is hiding something from you. The waters that flow down from the Abadeas aren't reaching where they used to. And that means that a disaster is on the horizon for the pastoral communities that depend on the river that flows from the Abadeas. The Iwaso Nyiro. My name is John Alanam. I'm a Kenyan investigative reporter, and I'm on a journey. I'm following these streams down from where they start, high above most of Kenya, down to where they join to form one of northern Kenya's most iconic rivers, the Iwasongiro. But the story I'm looking for is about the people who depend on it. From when the river is full, to the beginning of the worst drought in 10 years. I want to understand the story behind the drying up river and the conflict that comes when the river ends. I will fight with a panga, with a spear, with my own teeth. No day I will live here. And I have told my sons who are seven, none should leave this place. They should better perish because I got them from this soil and I will, I, I will have to fertilize this soil again. Mount Kenya is here and the Abadeas is here. Mount Kenya and the Abadeas ranges. Where we have got these water towers, okay, is where already the cloud system are based, okay? And remember, these are the regions which are feeding the whole of this region and even they feed Lake Victoria. And some of this water also feeds to the Indian Ocean. Okay? So, in the absence or in the presence of the climate change and things now change here, they will certainly change the lifestyle of virtually everybody in this area. Between the months of October 2016 and April 2017, all forecasts have shown that Kenya will be in the middle of one of the worst droughts in almost 10 years. But because it's hot now, many of us Kenyans will have forgotten that just a year earlier, this was one of the wettest periods in almost a decade. We were in the middle of El Nino. a weather phenomenon characterized by very high amounts of rainfall. In particular, if you look at the El Nino phenomenon, we know that we had an El Nino phenomenon in 2015, which, and that was as strong as the one we had in 97 and 98. These are two very strong El Ninos. So what we're now seeing, we're seeing the tail of that. We had a failure in the short rains last year, and it is very likely, I think it, the forecast is that the long rains will also be affected. It is part of the phenomenon. For a long time now in Kenya, we've seen reports of the effects of drought in some of the driest parts of our country, which is over 70% of Kenya's landmass. Rainfall levels in December were too low to reverse the dry spell in counties. A devastating drought is swelling through the northern, southern and eastern parts of the country. What is being described as the worst drought to hit the country since 2011. In September 2009, during the last La Nina period, I reported on one effect of drought. 
violence, a serious inter-clan conflict over pasture in what is now Isiolo County, Kenya's geographical center and a gateway to the north. It always bothered me that beyond going to the battleground then, I never really heard the stories of those fighting. I've come back exactly eight years later, this time around to hear the stories of the people who over the course of the droughts unfolding will be the hardest hit by extreme weather. I start at Archer's Post, a trading post where most of Isiolo's communities like the Borana, the Turkana and the Samburu meet. It's a livestock market day. People come from far away. It's a good time to make a sale. Grass and water are still available, so most of the animals here are healthy and will fetch a good price. But this is the tail end of the good times. Already, water levels in the Owasongiro River are looking quite low. I want to hear what local herders are thinking about the times ahead. I'm introduced to Lautiriman Letwo. We meet at the noisy mouth of the Iwasongiro. He agrees to take us into Samburu County, where a group of his friends are herding their family's livestock. And the further into our trip we get, the drier and harsher the landscape begins to look, and the search for water is on. This village on our way to Lotiriman's friends is a perfect example of what happens when grass around the homestead is no longer available. Apo. Apo, apo. <sighs> Nalparemo Salenyi's husband is already out with their family's herd. Wepe. Salama. Mambo. Ay, tunaizaenda sasa. She's been left behind with their four children, although it's about a month earlier than she had expected him to leave. Malinataka <laughs> Mm. Lotiriman's fellow Morans have been driving their cattle deep into Samburu County along the Wasongiro. Back in Nairobi, hydrologist Dr. Sean Avery, who's been studying Kenya's water systems since 1979, told me why they'd be going in this direction. That this is a picture of the basin. Mm -hmm which you're familiar with, showing the Laurian Swamp. And this, this is a magnet because mm. when you look at the, the basin there and you yeah. see where the water goes, in the dry periods, traditionally, mm. the Samburu have always moved into areas where there's no this pasture. Mm. These areas here collect water from the Matthews Range, from the Indotos, yeah. from the Milgis Lugger, from the Wasangir as well, but a mm -hmm. lot of it comes in from these other areas. Mm -hmm. So that basin there, is, is a basin which all these pastoralists know about. They yeah. come down from the north, they come from all directions yes. to exploit those resources. Around here. The Owasongiro feeds into a large catchment area north of Isiolo called the Lorian Swamp. For hundreds of years, this area has been a grass bank for the Samburu, the Borana, the Somali, and the Turkana communities. And the Owasongiro feeds this grass bank. But at this time, a lot less water from the Iwasongiro is feeding into it. Actually, if you look at the uh, Iwasongiro River, uh, the volumes of the Iwasongiro River over the years has been actually going down or uh, uh, going low. This is because of, one, uh, there has been uh, poor uh, 
uh, what we call say feed, uh, drainage in, in terms of feed because uh, this Wasanyoro river depends on the other feeder uh, rivers yeah. but if it does not go there it means uh, actually death. It takes us nearly a day's driving to get to Lotiriman's friends. For any herder, this would be a sight for sore eyes. Healthy herds in their hundreds. Driven by tens of young herders, some of whom are well armed. Just a few meters away, though, is evidence that the river is drying up faster than usual. It's still early in the dry season, but these young herders will be pushing up further north to areas where other communities are grazing. Up north, where they're headed, the Borana and the Samburu have fought before, and it's been deadly. In 2015 alone, 310 people were killed in intertribal clashes in northern Kenya. According to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Samburu, where I met Lotiriman and Isiolo, are two of the five hotspots. Most of the men here are well armed but are unsure about who we are and keep their guns well hidden. But when we settle down in the evening, there's no sign of tension about our presence there. Dinner is prepared in a flash and we all get to eat after the head of the group of these Morans, Juma Lashekwet, gets his share. Even if we paid for the goat. At dawn, everyone is up and ready to go again. Here in one of the many kraals of the Samburu, the cows are fat and very healthy. And I suspect the kraals of many other communities here along these plains will be the same. It's been a good rainy season and they've been all able to restock. But we're coming to the end of the good times here. And with the end of the good times, grass starts to thin, water becomes in short supply, and competition for those resources becomes even more tense. And with that tension becomes violence that often many people can't resolve and die from. These Morans will graze their herds here a little longer before pushing up northwards towards Borana territory. Juma, the Moran's leader, knows that diplomacy will be very important as they go forward. Seasons are changing here. Tough times are ahead. But is that all that's changing? If one looks at the population statistics for Kenya, one of the things that is very striking is that the population growth rates in the drylands is much higher than anywhere than the national average in the country. So although these areas are resource strapped, they have a finite limited resource by virtue of the fact that they are drylands, the irony is they've been put under 
much more disproportionate pressure by virtue of very significant increases in human population. According to the last census, the populations in West Pokot, Turkana, Samburu and Isiolo are growing at 5%, almost double their national average. With bigger families, more and different kinds of livestock are needed and water is getting harder to come by. <laughs> I leave Juma Lashekwet and his boys walking into an uncertain few months ahead as they wait for a rainy season that forecasters have said will be delayed. I come back in late October when the rain is supposed to start falling. This time we head into Borana territory. We start at a shallow well in Kina. There's nothing shallow about it anymore. With the rains delaying, people have to go deeper and deeper to get water. Hajj Goresi's cattle are getting thinner, but he's holding out hope that the rains will fall soon. We're deep into October at this time two weeks past the estimated period when the rains were supposed to fall. It's the turn of his cattle and goats to drink at the trough. With so many people here hoping to keep their animals alive, everyone has to respect order. And it's order that Hajj hopes will keep communities from fighting. A respected elder here in Kina, he's been part of the team that negotiated the Modogasha Declaration an agreement between the communities living in Isiolo about where to graze. Sasa the declaration isn't holding very well. We're already hearing murmurs about some cattle that was stolen and no one's taking any chances. Haj had to drive his cattle 17 kilometers just to get here. And as I go deeper into Borana territory, I see clearly just how desperate the search is getting. If ever there was a symbol of how badly this region needs water, then this is it. This is or was the Grisa Dam, a water pan that would gather the people of Isiolo County towards it. So promising it was that when they'd come here to quench their thirst all those 10 years ago when the government built this dam, the government also set up a chief's office here. Settlements started to come up. It looked as if this region would finally turn around its fortunes with regard to the lack of water. But years and years of drought had made sure that where I'm standing now, where water would reach about my waist, 
would eventually shrink and shrink further from the edges of this dam and finally go into the ground. And all that's left are cracks. The fault lines in intertribal relationships here are getting deeper as well. Hussein below would know. He's the head of the Kenya police reservists in the area and has just come back from resolving a rustling dispute between the Borana and the Samburu. So, Sasa in Wombe, a mother concerned Wombe as Samburu de Lopata, Aramisi Ukilopita, on Bekumi and Pundatatu. Easy Pundan boys are easy Moliziona. I can Wombe Ziari Terry to Mesha or some way up on Benana like in the Jaza is able to attack Piana Keshoyote. This shouldn't be taken as a small victory. It's progress. Considering that all the communities here are very well armed, the reaction to this theft could have gone very differently. Hussein is often at the front lines of clashes between communities, trying to separate them when things get violent. He points us in the direction of a place where mediation came too late. She had no livestock, no goat, no cow, no camel. She had nowhere to go. Kulamawe, Siricho, and up to Basa. Yeah. It was so painful. Salesa Forole invites me into his home just as dusk settles in. He lives in Gafarsa, a small oasis village on the border between Isiolo and Garissa County. It's an attractive place for the communities around it because it has grass and water. A few weeks ago, that blessing became Salesa's family's curse. Herders said to be from the Somali community came marauding one night. Salesa's 82-year-old mother and his 11-year-old nephew were the first ones they found in their path. Now, while there are men of my age, men who are younger than me, who can be part of the conflict, are there, they killed a mother of 82. Your mother? My own mother. They tied her this way. And they shot from point blank, from the left side, to the right side. There was no confrontation. My mother, as per today, have, have got only three, three young men. She has never got, had a boy. None of us, and they can be a witness, they know us all, none of us have ever, never went. We are friends with them all. They communicate to us and they tell us who did what. Then the question is, why did they kill a mother? Then came a young boy, standard one. 11 years. A child of 11 years. You tie at such a painful death. This is recurrent now. They want this war not to end, this conflict to go, go on. Salesa's pain brings back memories from his childhood, another period of drought. There was that time in the Shifta War. My mother gave back to me that time. I can recall. I suckled my mother because she had no livestock. For three and a half years. For three and a half years. And it's terminated by somebody. God forbid. Until I felt other, other enemies of mine don't suckle their mothers. I had to leave her. By then, I was in Duxi, I was reading Quran. 
I was as small as I was going to do it. She had to come, I circle, go, until the other boys were laughing at me. And then somebody who lives across, just, just across the town, just forget it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry for you. Don't mind. It's life. It's life. She had no livestock, no goat, no cow, no camel. She had nowhere to go. She has no other way. She has to tell, to say she better perish and then I should leave. And then somebody comes and terminates her life and then expects to live in a comfort life. No way. I tell you, no way. And I can tell anybody, no way. He is sure that his mother's killers wanted to start a war between the two communities, with the land Salesa's community sits on as the prize. The strong one will, will be staying and the weaker one will perish. Do you think that your community is ready to give up this land? I, I, I don't think. If only my daughter is as small as she is. If, if only I have that daughter, I cannot leave this place. I will fight. I will fight with a panga, with a spear, with my own teeth. No day I will live here. And I have told my sons, who are seven, none should leave this place. They should better perish. Because I got them from this soil, and I will, I, I will have to fertilize this soil again. At the edge of the village, I meet Salesa's younger brother, Rashid Abdi. Call to prayer sounds just as we approach his mother and his son's graves. I ask him whether he'd be willing to forgive the men who did this and I get more than I bargained for in his answer. Almost 79 years old. That Rashid says he knows the people who killed his son and his mother and that little has happened to find them shocks me and stays with me. I leave him to grieve a while longer. It's been a very confusing day for me where on the one hand you hear reassuring stories about how communities can come together to resolve things. But then we just come from the homestead and the graves of two brothers who've lost a mother and a son, all in the space of one evening when another community attacked them. And it just shows you that the culture of ethnic domination, of violence, especially around the issues of land and of grazing pasture, are still very deeply ingrained in the communities here. Those deaths, I don't think, are going to go unpunished, at least from the point of view of that community. And that's what worries me. From every direction, it looks like communities are under pressure and getting more aggressive. Something needs to happen to cool things down. Then, after weeks of waiting, something does happen. It rains. Back in Isiolo, on the second day of the rains, I pull Lord Manlel Kalkuli, the head of the Drought Management Authority, outside so that we can experience the first drops of rain in this region, late as they are. Shouldn't we be happy? I mean, this is, what, the second day that we've seen rain back here. Yeah. Shouldn't we be happy that this, is, this has now come? Actually, uh, I would say we should be happy, but uh, again, we are supposed to be to see ourselves. And this is the second day, but uh, according to the prediction that we are we are we are, we are facing, is that uh, we are actually going to the, the, these short trains will be 
uh, actually small. Yeah. Uh, it will be no, uh, undistributed below normal. It means uh, migration. It means uh, school dropout. It means uh, poor uh, in conflict. I leave town hoping against hope that by the time that I come back, somehow the rains will have washed away any prospect of violence. We come back on the 18th of December 2016, almost a month later. From Isiolo town to the countryside, I am greeted by a beautiful lush green. Green shoots of grass have replaced the dust coat that the county was under less than 30 days before. Everything seems to be right again. But with forecasts being what they were before the rain fell, I go back to the drought management office to check with Lord Mann. What our worry is that even normally, the long rains, that is the March, April, May, are not very good rains. Normally we don't expect a lot in this region. What we normally expect a lot and people rely on it is the October, November rains. But uh, definitely it means that the March, April, May rains will be uh, even below normal. The, the levels of Wasenyiro uh, currently is, uh, is very low compared to the, what we could say the normal. How many kilometers um, from where it's supposed to drain is it draining? Uh, currently it's actually draining uh, even over 80 kilometers before where it's supposed to actually the Lorian swamps. It's not good news. The rains were so badly needed here. The last time we saw a situation like this was in 2009 and 2010 when we had the last worst drought because uh, uh, at this particular time, that time, the short rains failed and then the long rains failed. So we had a very bad situation and it was also accelerated by conflicts. Going back into the field, I have to remind myself that the lush colors I'm seeing could be gone very quickly and everyone needs every drop of water they can get. My first stop is at the Grisa water pad. When I was here last, it was dry as a bone. When we last came here at the height of the dry season, it would be hard to imagine that this Grisa dam would ever fill up with water. In fact, I was standing somewhere around over there where that stone has just splashed into the water. And now life is returning to this dam. There's donkeys coming to drink water here and people bringing their tanks to be able to fill them up and survive another day in this harsh climate. But one has to wonder whether indeed this really is the level that should be represented here at the dam. What I'm told by residents is that it should be somewhere around here after a rainy season. But a shorter rain season and longer drought spells have ensured that things aren't quite the same as they used to be 10 years ago. Again, the further we move into Borana territory, the more the truth about the rains reveals itself. These herders have been walking for 50 kilometers. It's absolutely sweltering. The goats can smell the water we are carrying in our car, and soon we are surrounded. We move further. This time, it's a family that we meet. They're also searching for pasture. It's getting desperate. The National Drought Management Agency says that this drought has put at least 60,000 people at risk of starvation just here in Isiolo. And aid agencies are trying to fill the gap. Here at Balambata, villagers are getting one additional ration of food in preparation for the drought to come. On my mind, though, is the conflicts that this pressure causes. I make it back to Gafarsa, where I met Salesa and Rashid. 
Rashid's mother and his 11-year-old son were murdered by pastoralists from another community. He's still bitter. But there is cause to worry. Since we last met, another village and a school here were attacked. Again, everyone here is sure that they are being targeted for the land that they are on. And from what I've seen, the violence seems to be working. When you think of the words climate change, you often think about a rise in the temperatures. And if you were standing where I'm standing right now, you'd be right in assuming that that's the exact answer that encapsulates everything to do with the changing weather patterns that we are living through right now. What people often don't think about are emptied out villages such as this one in Belgesh, here in Isiolo County. People lived here once. These are where families cooked for one another. This is where neighbors borrowed salt from one another. And now nobody lives here because of conflict between communities. People often don't make the distinction between the conflicts on the ground and the changing weather patterns in which they live in and the environment in which they live. One would have to ask oneself, if this was caused by climate change, where are they now? In Samburu County, shallow wells on the bed of the Owasongiro River are the only way that herders can get to water for their cattle. And guns are a lot more present here. The herders' shyness about their guns has melted away now. I get the sense that they feel vulnerable at this shallow well. They say that they need to be ready in case herders from other communities show up here as well. I meet up with the Morans who I had spent time with in late September 2016. They're headed for Kom, at the border between Samburu County and Isiolo County, a dangerous place to be sure. They're set up like a military unit, but the need for grass drives them now more than anything else. Juma Leshekwet, the head of these Morans, is away checking on his family and has left his younger brother Leharto in charge. They're stressed about the grass, so they take our visit as a welcome break and let their guard down a little. We take one last photo together, capturing that moment in time before a very uncertain period in their lives. We have the wet season grazing reserve, we have the dry season, and we have the drought grazing reserves. And you see now, currently, they are supposed to be in uh, the wet grazing reserves. And people are now concentrating on, along the Wasanyiro River. And this is, means that they are going into reserves areas much more earlier than the normal times. Therefore, it means that um, uh, concentration of people will be moving towards Com, uh, Com area and it, even to the drought grazing reserves of Yamicha, Duma, and even areas like Boran. And this is now an area where we uh, also, our neighboring counties, 
uh, pastoralists are also moving towards the area. Those areas, for example, in Com, the Marsabit pastoralists, people from Mars, uh, Marsabit, will be moving towards Com. Sambor will be moving towards Com, and uh, then definitely we are seeing that there will be a likelihood of uh, resource-based conflict. The Lashakwets are headed north to Com, a town at the border between Isiolo and Samburu County. But some of their tribesmen are heading towards the Abadea Ranges where I started this story and to the Laikipia Plains. I catch up with one group of men and boys driving their cows through Rumuruti into the Abadeas in the dead of the night. These tens and hundreds of cattle being driven across the plains have been on a very long and desperate journey, looking for grass, looking for pasture, and they're being driven up towards the Abadea Ranges and Mount Kenya. Now the fear is that if they get there, while there might be grass up in those ranges, the temperatures will be so low, too low, for them to be able to survive, and they could die in their hundreds. Pasture for their animals is their primary concern now, and they search day and night for it. The river that once quenched the thirst of animals in this region and the rains that renew the landscape may be back, but for these communities, those rains and that river may as well have come to an end. In the next part of my journey, I go to the plains of Laikipia. I see the cost of conflict firsthand. One driven by drought, a fight for land set up since the colonial days, and bitter politics of a coming election. This government is targeting, he wants to finish us. We're headed down to Majianyoka, and we're the first ones who, outside of the staff of the Laikipia Nature Conservancy, have been allowed to go anywhere close to the place that was burnt just a few days ago. And to be honest, I'm a little nervous because we don't know, given there's a lot of security here, but we don't know how close or how far the, the raiders are. And it's dusk right now.